This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Luis Gasparetto of Brazil is no ordinary artist. He works at a frenzied pace, often completing drawings and paintings in less than five minutes. Incredibly, Gasparetto claims that his every move is guided by the spirits of long-dead artists, creating new works from beyond the grave. Does Luis Gasparetto possess stunning psychic powers? Tonight, you can judge for yourself. For nearly three years, Tara Breckenridge was a waitress in some of Houston's most fashionable adult nightclubs. Then one evening in 1992, she left work and mysteriously vanished. Tara's family believes she was a victim of foul play and that her boyfriend knows more than he is admitting. December 1944, the Second World War still raged across Europe, but for a brief moment, peace reigned in one tiny corner of Belgium. On Christmas Eve, three American GIs and four Nazi soldiers put down their guns to share an unlikely holiday dinner. Now the young boy who helped make friends out of bitter enemies needs your help to find the men who gave him an unforgettable Christmas. To his fellow parishioners in Virginia Beach, Virginia, Carlos Garcia was an honest, devout Christian. No one suspected that Garcia was in fact a devious con artist who would eventually scam his church and the people in his community out of more than $2 million. Join me for these intriguing cases. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. For those who love art, it is tempting to wish that the great masters could return to paint just one more glorious canvas. Utterly impossible? Of course. Unless you believe in the extraordinary claims of a man named Luis Gasparetto. As he whips color across the page, Gasparetto seems a man possessed. Indeed, if Gasparetto's astounding assertions are true, his every gesture is directed by the spirits of long-dead masters who continue to create new works from beyond the grave. Van Gogh, Monet, Renoir, all gone now for more than half a century. But believe it or not, Luis Gasparetto says that these paintings are nothing less than their recent work channeled through him. Is Gasparetto a gifted psychic, as he claims, or a flamboyant showman, as common sense would dictate? We invite you to see for yourself. Luis Gasparetto grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil's largest city. The culture here is laced with mysticism, and many consider psychic experiences part of everyday life. The Gasparetto family is no exception. Luis's mother, Zibia, has written 13 books, works she says were all channeled from the spirit world. Luis was just a boy when he first began to believe that he, too, possessed psychic abilities. At the age of 13, Luis was overwhelmed by stress, sleeplessness, and trouble at school. Zibia thought he needed counseling and took him to see Madame Laïs, one of the city's best-known clairvoyants. Você vem comigo? Ok, você fica calmo. Relaxa. 
tá? Vai dar tudo certo pra gente descobrir o que é isso. I was embarrassed because it was the first time there, and uh, but I started to feel all that my body shaking inside and all that energy. And something was holding my throat, and I tried to control myself, and that gets worse. So I, I had to, to let it go. Gasparetto recalls feeling pain and tingling in his arm. To Madame Laïs, it was a sign he would be able to channel writing, much like his mother. But quite unexpectedly, Luis began to draw. Gasparetto had found his calling. Gasparetto says that over the past three decades, he has channeled more than 20,000 paintings by some 50 artists. His claims go largely unchallenged in Brazil. And Gasparetto's reputation has begun to spread around the world. In January of 1995, we asked to film one of his channeling sessions ourselves. When you invite me for a presentation, I ask them if they want to, if they want to come, because I cannot do it myself. So if they say yes, I just you know, accept the invitation. Our invitation was apparently accepted and we filmed Gasparetto in New York City. Gasparetto works with such intensity, an assistant holds down the work. The sensation of coming in, involving me, you know, involving my arms, and I just let it go. And the arm goes by that force, not me. It's not coming from the inside, it comes from the outside. During the frenetic session, Gasparetto completed six drawings and three paintings, most in less than five minutes. He moved easily between different artistic styles. I try not to control anything. I try not to put my thoughts or my ideas. But you see, people think that uh, if you are unconscious, it's gonna be somebody else coming through you or taking your body. That's impossible. Nobody takes your body, you know. It's just an energetical influence through you. So I just learned to be passive. During the 45 minutes we were filming, Gasparetto says he channeled works by seven artists, among the greatest of all time. An impressive accomplishment, but is it proof that the great masters are hard at work in the afterlife? Perhaps some comparisons are in order. A painting by Pierre-Auguste Renoir completed in 1877. Auguste Renoir, 1995, is channeled through Luis Gasparetto in roughly five minutes. Claude Monet, 1880. Claude Monet through Gasparetto. Vincent van Gogh, 1890. Van Gogh through Gasparetto. Art experts in the United States are hardly convinced. The notion that any one of these artists, take a van Gogh, for example, a man of, of extraordinary intensity and seriousness of purpose to think that he would want to come back after his death and produce uh, third, fourth, fifth-rate imitations of what he successfully did during his life seems to me incredible. Gasparetto certainly seems to be possessed by some force. I mean, perhaps it's the force of his own subconscious playing back images that he's seen in art history books, or perhaps he's really receiving these images from the afterlife. I mean, I certainly can't say. The painters are, are coming through me because they want to they wanna show that there is life after death, and they want us to think about eternity. They want to help the evolution of our conceptions of life. They want us to see life in a different way. Is Luis Gasparetto a window to the metaphysical side of art? 
Can there possibly be any substance to his stunning claims? No matter what you may believe, even a skeptic has to admit that Luis Gasparetto puts on a great show. Next, the search for a beautiful young waitress who mysteriously vanished in 1992. The men's club in Houston, Texas is an upscale adult night spot. The clientele is mostly male. The entertainment, topless. For many of us, it is tempting to make assumptions about the type of women who dance and work here. But don't be deceived. Consider the case of Tara Breckenridge, who waited tables at the men's club from 1989 to 1992. Tara grew up in Del Rio, Texas, population 34,000. She was a third of five children in an upstanding, devoutly religious family. Tara was a very caring type person, a very loving type person, very nurturing type person. She was always very upbeat, very cheerful. Just a real wonderful daughter to have. Shortly after graduating from high school in 1987, Tara set off for Houston to pursue a career in photography. But in the end, financial reality forced her to take up waitressing and ultimately landed her at the men's club. Joe from last yes. week. That's right. He came Tara back. wasn't the type of person you would think would work in a place like that. It was more just for the money, you know. She was going to school and stuff, so it made her the money that she was comfortable with, and she was happy with that. When Tara Breckenridge arrived in Houston, she was no different than thousands of small town girls with big city dreams. But for Tara, the dream may have ended in a horrible nightmare. In 1992, she vanished without a trace. The police and her parents fear the worst. They believe that Tara was murdered. And high on the list of possible suspects is Tara's boyfriend at the time, a young man named Wayne Hecker. They met in 1989 two years after Tara arrived in Houston. Even though Tara had never danced at the men's club, Wayne was less than thrilled about her job. She was working before I met her in those kind of places, and, and uh, she loved the money and she loved the atmosphere, and I guess that's just something that you want to grow out of, and I'm not going to tell her where to work, you know? Wayne was not happy about Tara working at a topless club, but he, you know, accepted it because it was paying the bills. And so Tara, you know, worked at night, and, you know, Wayne wasn't working at the time, so he didn't have much of a choice. Despite Wayne's misgivings, the young couple soon moved in together. At first, they seemed happy, but as time passed, the relationship became more and more contentious. How are you? Tara and Wayne's relationship was kind of rocky, to say the least. Um, she was always talking about moving out or thinking about moving out and uh, we would discuss it at times and she would say she needed to talk it over with him and and uh, occasionally we talked about her doing it without talking it over first in july of 1992 tara made a visit to her parents home in del rio tara's mother says she felt that something was not quite right I think maybe her problems were a lot bigger than we would have guessed, and we had no way of really knowing because she didn't talk to us about it, and we didn't know to ask at the time. Two weeks later, on August 3rd, 1992, Tara was back in Houston, working at the men's club. It was a slow night, and management decided to send two waitresses home early. Hey, Tara. Tara. Anybody want to go? I'll go. You want to? I need one more. Any volunteers? I'll go home. No kidding. Yeah, it's slow. Not much happening. Everyone was surprised when Tara volunteered to leave. It was strangely out of character. I don't think so. It'd be a little unusual for Tara to ask to go home. She wasn't always uh, interested in leaving. She was there till 2 o'clock to see if she, you know, till closing time, make as much money as she could. Tara changed into street clothes, and at 12.29 a.m., she punched out for the night. 
Tara, when she left, walked past the doorman without saying, you know, goodbye or without responding to his goodbye. And that would have been unusual. Security guard indicated that he carried her tote bag that she had when she left the club. He physically took it from her and carried it as he escorted her to her vehicle. He watched her get in the vehicle. He told her to be safe uh, as she drove home and then uh, saw that she exited the parking lot. We asked him if anybody followed her or if he, or if he saw anybody follow her, and he said he did not. At the very moment Tara was leaving the men's club, her boyfriend Wayne Hecker says he was in a pool hall 15 minutes away. Wayne had phoned Tara earlier that evening, but never spoke to her. Uh, and I didn't really think anything at that time, and they told me that she was on the floor. I probably got home at around five, and I expected to see Tara either laying on the sofa or in bed, and she wasn't there. So at that point, I mean, I would do like anybody else would that was in love with someone, or I went to find her. Indeed, it would be Wayne who found Tara's car at 7 a.m., abandoned by the side of a busy freeway. When I saw the car, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is what's it doing there? Uh, apparently, she drove the car there. The car alarm wasn't even on. Um, the flashers weren't even on. That really surprised me. Tara's car was locked, and a can of mace was inside. And she always carried her mace on her. And when I saw the mace in the car, I thought, why is the mace in the car, and why aren't the flashers on? And why isn't the car? We did have a car alarm while I wasn't engaged. The police feared that Tara had met with foul play. Before long, suspicion began to center on Wayne. Investigators were especially curious about his activity the night Tara disappeared. We have employees of the club that indicated that he left the club approximately midnight, 12.30, and was next seen at approximately 1.45 in the morning. The pool hall is located here, 15 minutes from the men's club. Tara's car was found here, just three miles from the club. Wayne's alleged absence from the pool hall was a full hour and 45 minutes. Well, there's certain uh, actions and reactions that we've got from Wayne that, uh, that cast suspicion upon himself. Uh, obviously, we don't have any evidence to support a belief that he may or may not be involved in this, but he certainly has not been eliminated as a suspect either. Yeah. Maybe you had something. Later, we put the question directly to Wayne Hecker. Okay. How do you respond to the charge that Wayne Hecker had something to do with Tara's disappearance? Uh, to tell you the truth, um, I don't, I don't owe an explanation to anybody but the Lord, and the Lord has given me, uh, you know, he's, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to hear something, and it's from him. I, I, I can't, I can't answer to anybody because there's not an answer uh, that I have, only he has it, and, and until there is an answer, I don't think anybody will be satisfied, and, and they, I might be pinpointed for the rest of my life, and I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. There's a lot of people that have said things, made a lot of derogatory statements, and and uh, um, that's I, I can't I can't help them. With no concrete evidence of foul play, Tara Breckenridge was officially listed as missing. Then the police obtained a series of love notes that indicated there had been another man in Tara's life. One note said, "Please don't be scared. Do what your heart tells you." I'm very excited that you'll marry me. But another one said, the more you hold out, the longer you jeopardize what I feel for you. According to people at the club, Tara's admirer was a frequent visitor and often lavished her with $100 tips. He apparently had intimate knowledge of her difficulties with Wayne. But the notes seemed to indicate that in the end, Tara rejected the man's advances. There was nothing threatening in those notes. Uh, we interviewed the individual. Uh, our, our opinion at this point is uh, he was just an individual that had an attraction toward Tara and nothing more. But if Tara's admirer was not a suspect, who was? 
Once again, a shadow of doubt was cast upon Wayne Hecker. Wayne did know about the guy, but, uh, and I th do honestly think there was some jealousy, but I don't think that, you know, it would cause him to do anything stupid. I haven't been charged with a crime, no. Not at all. I, I didn't commit a crime, so I cannot be charged with one. Simple as that. I, I love the woman to death. She's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, she's a great girl. Yeah, I do. I love her. I love her with all my heart, and and um, I hope the whole world hears that. Tara Breckenridge would today be 26 years old. She's five feet five inches tall and weighs 120 pounds. Her car was found abandoned in the 1200 block of the West Loop North in Houston, Texas, on the morning of August 4th, 1992. Next, the remarkable story of an unlikely friendship between bitter enemies, three American GIs and four German soldiers. The story you're about to see is one of the most remarkable tales to ever come out of the Second World War. Remarkable for the fact that it involves no fighting and no bloodshed. In 1973, Reader's Digest magazine published the account. And in 1985, it was a focal point of a speech given by President Ronald Reagan. Tonight, we need your help to find three unknown American GIs and write the closing chapter of this amazing saga. December 1944, the battered German army launched its last great offensive along an 85-mile front in Belgium's Ardennes Forest, the infamous Battle of the Bulge. Nearly 16,000 American soldiers would lose their lives. Another 60,000 would be wounded or captured. It was the costliest battle the United States would wage in any war. Within earshot of the fighting, on the edge of the Ardennes forest, stood a small, isolated cabin. There, Fritz Winken, a 12-year-old German boy, lived with his mother, Elizabeth. Fritz's father, Hubert, had moved his family to the cabin for safekeeping. But life in the forest was difficult. While Hubert served as a civilian baker for the German army 20 miles away, Fritz and his mother struggled to put food on the table. My father thought, like everybody else, that the war would be ended, would be over by Christmas, but it was not to be. And our stay in this shack was longer than we anticipated. Christmas Eve 1944 arrived with an air of sadness and uncertainty. Hubert has still not returned and his family was resigned to the fact that they would be spending the holiday without him. Ich weiß, heute ist Weihnachten. Aber weißt du, wenn er kommen könnte, er würde bestimmt da sein. Bestimmt. Fritz's mother tried to make the evening as festive as possible. She scraped together a Christmas meal of a few potatoes and a scrawny rooster. My mother blew out the candle and uh, went to the door and I went with her. She opened the door and there were these soldiers. Yeah, ja, bitte? Um, good evening, ma'am. Do you speak English? Nein. Uh, we're Americans. They tried to talk to us, but uh, my mother Our didn't friend. speak English. Friend's been shot. Can we come inside for a while, please? My mother just looked, and she looked at the guy sitting in the snow. Come rein. Thank you. Until finally, my mother, after it seems to be like an eternity to me, uh, she asked him to come in. Here, aufs Bett. Da ist's am besten. Fritz's mother knew full well that harboring the enemy was punishable by death. 
but she was more than willing to take the risk. The injured soldier had been shot in the leg and had lost a great deal of blood. Elizabeth did her best to make him comfortable. What is she saying? I don't know. Ask her if she speaks French. Parlez-vous français? Mais oui. Vous êtes séparé de votre armée? Oh, oui, madame. He said that they had lost their units and were wandering through the Ardennes for the past two days and two nights. Je vais changer les bandages. She's going to change his bandage. Fritz, hold doch bitte mal das Tuch, dann reiß ich My mother was all motherhood. She worried for them and she worried for the wounded man and she did everything she could. They were very nice. Like big boys from the neighborhood, you know. So how you doing, kid? Have a nice Christmas, son, boy? Fritz's mother made the American GIs feel right at home. He doesn't understand a word we're saying. The men began to relax in anticipation of an unexpected Christmas dinner. We thought automatically this must be more Americans. And I went to the door and opened the door. And there were four German soldiers. I was petrified with fear. He said, we have lost our units, and we would like to warm up a little bit. So my mother said, you not only be allowed to warm up, but you get a nice dinner if you accept our guests. And my mother said, this is Christmas night and there will be no shooting around here. Put your arms in the wooden shed and then we come out and have a nice, nice Christmas. Tut was ich sag. Leg die Waffen auf den Haufen ab und kommt rein. Ich hab Hunger. Meanwhile, my mother had turned to the Americans, who by then had noticed that some Germans were coming, and had turned to their guns also. Je vais les garder jusqu'à demain. My mother said to me, get more potatoes and more water. We had more mouth to feed. For about uh, a minute or two, maybe three, there was a tension. Good abend. Hello. But then uh, it was warm, it smelled good, and right away there was a a sense of hospitality. Oh, you speak English? Yes, a little. Your comrade. He's wounded? Yeah. Um, yeah, he got around in the thigh earlier. Uh, one of the German soldiers went over to the American that were wounded and asked the Americans in English what was wrong with him. So what do you think? Hmm. He's lucky. He's lost a lot of blood, but the cold has prevented the wound from getting infected. He should recover, provided he gets some rest and nourishment. Good, good. He had managed. some first aid kit, and he applied a dressing to the wound. And the whole evening, he would every now and then go and look after him. That night, hostility ceased in at least one corner of the forest as American and German soldiers sat down together to honor the Christmas spirit. My mother said grace. Lieber Herrgott, wir danken dir. It was not a regular prayer, it, it was something spontaneous. And she said that uh, that's all thank the Lord for being together tonight, peaceful in this terrible war and let's enjoy dinner, the little things that we have, and let's promise to be friendly to each other uh, forever if possible. 
Let's also pray for an end of this terrible war so that we all can go home very soon. And by that time, by the time they were all crying, by the time they were all crying, uh, not profusely, but the tears were rolling, you know, even the German surgeons, I was very surprised. And uh, then we ate and the tears disappeared. But from then on, there was a feeling of friendship that permeated the whole room. It was wonderful. I never forget it. After dinner, the soldiers drifted outside one by one. Elizabeth and Fritz soon joined them. As they gazed heavenward, each gave thanks in his own way. That night, the men would sleep side by side under the same roof. The differences of war temporarily set aside. They were so peaceful. You never think that there are two different kinds of soldiers that one day before they would have shot each other. Sie gehen hier am Bach entlang. Fritz remembers that the spirit of brotherhood continued the next morning. The German soldiers helped construct a makeshift stretcher for the injured GI, and then gave the Americans directions back to their line. That same day, Fritz and his mother left with the Germans and were soon reunited with Fritz's father. Five months later, the war would end. In the early 1960s, Fritz Winken immigrated to the United States, Today, he is an American citizen living in Hawaii. Like his father before him, Fritz owns and operates a bakery. But that special night in 1944 remains a defining moment of Fritz's life. He now hopes to find the American GIs who helped him learn the true meaning of Christmas. It showed me what my mother could do, and it showed me what one single human being can do to avoid bloodshed and to bring peace. And it also showed me at a very early age that we're all alike. Even though, no matter what uniform we wear, uh, we have the same joys, the same sorrows, the same problems. And uh, it was a very significant experience. I never forgot it. <laughs> On a previous broadcast, we told you of Earl and Donna Chotbacks, a young couple intent on building their dream house on this breathtaking site, 200 miles north of Denver, Colorado. Don't you think we ought to build a log house right here? Big picture window? In April of 1991, Earl and Donna hired a builder they knew as Mark Mitchell, whose specialty was log cabin homes. There you go, into your new home. A contract was drawn up and reviewed by the Chotbacks and their attorney. Earl and Donna gave Mitchell $25,000 as a deposit, their entire life savings. Then they waited for their dream house to take shape. But weeks stretched into months, and no structure ever rose on Earl and Donna's property. Every time they questioned Mitchell, he had an excuse and told them not to worry. The final blow came six months later, when the Chotvax banker turned up disturbing information about Mark Mitchell. Well, I'm afraid the news isn't good. Now, it has nothing to do with you two. The problem is with the builder. It appears this man is in some serious trouble. He has been taking deposit money, just as he did yours, and then has not started construction on the homes. As a matter of fact, Mark Mitchell is not even his real name. It's Wade Mitchell Parker. At that point, I'm sorry. Uh, I felt nauseous. Suddenly, just was sick, feeling as though we were going to lose all the money that we had given to Mark Mitchell. 
Wade Mitchell Parker, alias Mark Mitchell, left town soon after. He allegedly disappeared with more than $1 million, stockpiled from at least 30 other fraud victims. Parker avoided arrest for nearly three years until just after the most recent broadcast of this story. On August 11, 1994, Wade Mitchell Parker was arrested in Cobb County, Georgia, some 1,300 miles from Colorado. There, Parker was using two new aliases, Ronald Anderson and Larry Wheeler. But information developed from our program helped reveal his true identity. On September 26, 1994, Wade Mitchell Parker was arraigned in Colorado on fraud and theft charges. Our cameras are not allowed inside the courtroom. However, Earl and Donna Chotbanks made sure they were on hand to see justice done. If he'd have been an honest man, we'd be living in our home right now and raising our children. I think that anybody who has been ripped off this way could take heart from this, you know, knowing that with enough perseverance, they may get their guy, you know, so uh, it certainly gave me a lot of a, a lot of heart when I was beginning to lose hope. These days, the church seems like one of the few places where you can expect to be safe from the harsh realities of the outside world. Certainly is the last place you'd expect to find a con artist at work. But for a devious swindler named Carlos Garcia, the hallowed sanctuary provided the perfect setup. The Holy Family Church in Virginia Beach, Virginia, serves a small, tightly knit Hispanic community. Parishioners are honest and hardworking, but by no means affluent. In 1985, the church welcomed a new member. Carlos Garcia was a friendly middle-aged businessman who soon managed to ingratiate himself in the community. What really struck me about him when he first came to us was how honest he seemed to be and how concerned he seemed to be for the people of our community, for the Hispanic people, especially with the Mexicans. He was extremely close to the Mexican community and he earned their trust immediately, just like he earned mine. Let me just say how excited I am. We've had a great year. By 1988, Carlos had been elected president and treasurer of the local pastoral council, which oversaw the church budget and expenditures. It was an important, prestigious position. No one yet suspected that Garcia was, in reality, a brazen thief who would end up stealing $2 million from his church and his fellow parishioners. All the items that have an asterisk, you'll find the explanation on page two. There was, um, for many people, almost an immediate trust that this is somebody who has come to this country, who has become successful, and now is helping other people. Can we approve the minutes? Unfortunately, we found out that the trust that had been put in Carlos had been betrayed in, in just in many ways. Garcia used his position in the church to attract clients to a seemingly legitimate tax preparation business. Over several years, Donaciano and Irma Naranjo gave Carlos more than $13,000 to turn over to the IRS. The IRS never got a penny. We didn't know how the system worked here for paying taxes and all that. As we come from Mexico, we didn't know a thing. He helped us arrange our citizenship, our immigration cards, and he always helped us with everything. So that's why we trusted him so much. And that's why we trusted him with our taxes. He takes advantage of the fact that a great many of the individuals he comes in contact with are unfamiliar with federal income tax laws. Uh, they trust him to guide them through what really must appear a maze. Uh, unfortunately, they don't realize that he has no intention of taking them anywhere but to the cleaners, so to speak. But Garcia's tax preparation scam was just the tip of the iceberg. 
he obtained privileged and confidential information from hundreds of community members. He then used that knowledge to order credit cards in the names of his fellow churchgoers and their deceased relatives. He would use the information that he obtained about other people to build resumes, obtain credit cards, establish bank accounts, and with his credit cards, he even assumed the identities of females. And he would charge things on these credit cards. And nobody would ever question the fact that he was signing what would appear to be a female name, simply because it was Hispanic. And he would explain to them that sometimes a name that you would assume would be female was not because it was a Hispanic name. And he got away with it. For most con men, that would have been enough. But Carlos Garcia was also something of a ladies' man. One woman, whom we will call Anna, dated Carlos for six years and never got the slightest inkling that he was up to no good. When Carlos learned that Anna's mother had a large sum of money to invest, he encouraged her to put the funds in a CD. He had told her that the interest rate would be better at his credit union and he had already picked up the signature cards and everything and brought those with him. So she filled out the application and the signature card, and um, he took the money, he put it in the credit union. I think it's an excellent investment. Well, thank you, Carlos. Unbeknownst to Anna and her mother, Carlos co-signed the signature card. Before long, he had emptied the account to the tune of $25,000. So I thank you very, very much. It hurts, you know, it hurts that, you know, that all of these years you thought that someone cared about you and really they were just using you. For eight years, Carlos Garcia operated at will. Finally, one of his clients became suspicious and contacted the IRS inspection office. The taxpayer alleged that she had given Carlos cash monies for three consecutive years for Carlos to apply and send to the Internal Revenue Service. She subsequently learned that Carlos, that IRS did not have any record of her filing or any payments made to the Internal Revenue Service. In 1993, the client made a phone call to Carlos to discuss her situation. Hello? Carlos had no idea that IRS inspectors were listening in. Carlos, I'm calling because I've received some letters from the IRS and um, they say that they haven't received uh, payments from me. And, you know, I, I paid you in cash, and I don't have any record of it. Obviously, there's been a terrible mistake. I will call them on Monday morning and straighten this whole situation out. Well, so you do have the record, then. You can prove to them that I gave you the payment in cash. Yes, I've got those records. I know you paid me. I've got everything right here. I will take care of it. You understand? OK, then I'll, I'll wait to hear from you. Thank you, Carlos. Bye-bye. Carlos Garcia was arrested a few days later. He soon posted bail. Within a week, Garcia slipped out of Virginia Beach and vanished. When investigators searched through Garcia's records and documents, they discovered his true identity, Fernando Zapico. Zapico. A native of Argentina is a career con artist whose life of crime spans more than four decades and includes at least 17 aliases. Authorities say that Zapico has built hundreds of victims up and down the East Coast out of millions of dollars. Probably even greater than the loss of funds from our Hispanic community has been the loss of trust and the real betrayal that people have felt of someone whom they loved and respected and truly looked up to as a leader of our community. And now they find that they've been betrayed by him. Our dreams came crashing down. And now we can't trust anyone anymore. We're afraid something like this will happen again. Because he was a man who belonged to the church. It was impossible to conceive that he would steal from the church. And yet, that's what he did. I still have times when it's hard for me to accept this. I still have times when I feel like cry, when I feel depressed, because I trusted him. 
I believed in him. He took money from people that were simple people. Again, people that trusted him. And these people will never be the same again. We all, we, the whole community will never be the same again. Join me next Friday for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.